think about that, if you'll open your Bible with me tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when we think about that, one of the things that comes to mind is, is how much work is still left to be done. The great work, you have many missionaries that come here, many missionaries that, that tell about what God's doing and about the need in their countries. And all around the world, there's a tremendous need for the gospel, a tremendous need uh, for the work to be done. And I want to just say that I praise the Lord uh, for a church like this that has such a heart for missions. A church that has such a burden for missions and is doing so much for missions. And, and that's why I just want to encourage you tonight to continue, faith, continue faithfully in what you're doing. And don't let up. Don't give in. Don't stop. And that's why tonight the message is entitled, No Fainting Allowed. No Fainting Allowed. And so when we think about fainting, why is it that someone would faint? You know, someone usually would faint when they're overexerted or, or when they're tired or when they're scared or, or usually when they're carrying something that is too heavy or more than they can carry, therefore they just faint. They give up, they give in, they throw in the towel and they stop right there. And so tonight I want to encourage you the importance of not fainting in what you're doing for the Lord. And, and even above that, that, how we cannot stop and be satisfied and content where we're at. We must continue moving forward. We must continue doing more and more constantly for the Lord and not fainting under the load that sometimes we have to carry. It's interesting in this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and even the chapter itself starts out in verse 1. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, what does he say? We faint not. Interesting, isn't it? Then we jump all the way over almost to the end of the chapter in verse 16, and he repeats it. He goes back and he says, For which cause, and what does he say? We faint not. So I think the Apostle Paul also understood the importance of not fainting in the work of the Lord, not fainting in the task that God has given us. And this is especially important when it comes to the context of what we're seeing here. We don't have time to go into all the context, but if you look at the first verses there in the chapter, and, and even the, the actual verse 1 itself, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this, what? Ministry. We have this ministry. What is the ministry? The ministry of preaching the Word of God. And it goes on to talk about how Jesus Christ and the gospel. And, and, there, and, and then when we get to verse 7, he says, But we have this treasure, referring to the verses that he just talked about, Jesus Christ, the gospel, what Jesus did for us. So basically what he's saying there is we have, all of us have a ministry. That we have something that has been given to us that is of great value. And here he refers to it as a treasure. And what is that treasure? That treasure is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That treasure is the ministry. That is the ministry that he has given us to each and every one of us. He has given us a treasure that is the gospel to, to be taken to the world. It is the most important, the most valuable treasure that, that there has ever, has ever been. Because it is the only thing that can truly change the lives of the people around the world that do not know him. It's the only thing that can make a difference in the lives of many of these people. It is a treasure. It is of such value. And God has entrusted it to us. And so when we think about that, then we can go back to what we just said and see its importance, how that we must not faint in what God has given us to do. We must not give up. We must not give in. We must not stop. We must continue going forward, taking this treasure of the gospel to so many people who have never heard, sending those to take the gospel to those who have never heard. We must not faint. Amen? We must not faint. And so the question then comes, how can we continue without fainting? How can we accomplish this goal? How can we continue without throwing in the towel, giving up, stopping where we're at, not continuing forwards, or not doing more than what we're even doing today? I think in this passage, in this very chapter, he goes over several things that will help us so that we can continue without fainting. Four words that I want to share with you tonight, just four words. And I think the first thing that we see here, the first thing that's so important, the word is humility. Humility. It goes back at verse 7 where he starts out and he says, we have this treasure. It's interesting, he says, we have this treasure in what? Earthen vessels. So what is he talking about? He's basically talking about clay pots. 
So when we think about a treasure, normally a treasure we would think about would be carried in, in some type of a container that would be very luxurious, very fancy, of much value, very beautiful. But why? Because it's taking a treasure. It's carrying something of great value. It might have, have beautiful colors on it. It might be trimmed in gold itself. Because why? It is taking a treasure, something of great value. But he says this treasure, which is the gospel, is being carried not in something of luxury, not in something that is special, but it's simple earthen vessels. And guess what that earthen vessel is? That's us. That's us. That's me and you. We're just nothing more than clay pots in the hands of the potter. And you see, when we think about that, you know, those clay pots, and, you know, when we think of a clay pot, we don't think of something of great value. Do we? If we thought of something, maybe a porcelain vase or, or something made from crystal, we think, wow, that is of great value. That is, we, we carry it with, with much care. But when we think about a clay pot, if we drop a clay pot and it breaks, we'd be like, well, I guess I'll go buy another clay pot. <laughs> it's not that, not that important, not of such great value. And so what he's trying to teach us here is that we, are, that we have been entrusted this treasure, but the treasure of the gospel is taken is to be carried it's in us, which are just simple clay vessels. And that teaches us about humility. In other words, the important thing isn't the messenger, but it's the message. The important, we're not important in this, but his message is important. He is the one that is important. And why is it that it is so important? If we continue reading the verse, it tells us. He says that this treasure, it, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of, what does it say? God and not of us. You see, because He is the only one that is worthy of all honor and glory and power and everything that He does. And you see, if we go about with this, this treasure, we go about carrying and taking this treasure, if we think that we're the important ones, we're, we're trying to steal God's glory from Him. And the Bible tells us that He will not share His glory with anyone. And so there's a danger there so that when we are, are so puffed up, and it's interesting, years, years ago in Bolivia, I preached a message on, on being, do not be blowfish Christians. Because what is a blowfish? They basically, when you touch them or you, 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 you get around them, what do they do? They blow up, right? And the Bible talks about us being uh, puffed up. And, 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 and when something is like that, when something is blown up and something is expanded like that, what is usually the tendency of that? Is it very sturdy? Usually it's something that's very easy to burst, right? As a balloon is filled with air, the more air you have in it, the closer it's getting to what? To bursting, to rupturing. And so in our lives, the more puffed up we get, the more inflated we get in, in, as a Christian in what we're doing, the easier it is for us to burst. The easier for it for, is for us to, 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 to fall by the wayside because we must always give God the honor and the glory. We must always realize that we're nothing but clay vessels. We're clay pots in the, in the hands of the potter. And you see, that way when these burdens come and these trials come and the things come in our life that we have to face, you know, if, if we're the one that's puffed up, what will we say? Well, well I don't really deserve this. You know, I, don't, I shouldn't have to go through this. I shouldn't have to face this in my life. Why is this happening to me? God, why? And a lot of times it causes us to get discouraged and just kind of throw in the towel and just lay it by the wayside. But you see, if we realize we're nothing but that, those clay pots in the hands of the potter, then we realize that God can do whatever he wishes with us. Whatever comes our way, whatever we face, we can know that he is in control. He is the one that is in control. We're nothing more than those simple vessels that God has chosen to put that treasure that is so important and take it to a lost and a dying world. So the first thing we see there is humility, the first word. The second word that we see here is attitude. Attitude, verses 8 and 9. I've always loved these verses. I've always loved these verses, and especially when I begin to see them in the context of what we're talking about here. Because if you notice in these verses, he tells us four times he gives us a contrast between two things. He says, we are this but we are not this. We are this, but we're not this. We're this, we're not this, we're this, we're not this. And it's very interesting, interesting when we begin to see that comparison that he gives us. He starts out in verse 8 and he says, We are troubled on every, on every side, yet not distressed. So when he says we're troubled on every side there, it has the idea of being under a lot of pressure. 
Have you ever felt like you're just under a lot of pressure, here, especially here lately? You just feel like the, the weight is so heavy on your shoulders that you're carrying. The pressure that you're under just has you to the point to where you don't think you can continue on. You don't think you can, you ever felt like that? I think we all have, haven't we? We're under so much pressure. But then he says, we're on, we're, uh, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. And that has the idea of not being completely smashed. So basically he's saying, you know what? We have a lot of pressure on us a lot of times. but we haven't been smashed. The second thing he says there is we are perplexed. That's basically kind of what you would understand it to mean. We're without answers. Have you ever just felt like you, you don't have the answers? <laughs> you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going to happen. You just come to the point where you're like, I don't know. I have no idea what is going on, what is going to happen, what I'm going to face in my life. A lot of times we feel like that. He says we're without answers. We're perplexed, but he says, but not in despair. In other words, we haven't got to the point where we just throw in the towel. He says we're under a lot of pressure. A lot of times we don't have the answers. Well, we're not going to throw in the towel. The third thing he says, the third example he gives in verse 9, he says we're persecuted. That has the idea of being hunted or stalked. Being, being persecuted. You know, it, it feels like a lot of times that the whole world is against us. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like it just seems like everyone is against you? A lot of times it's even the ones that are closest to us, the, thing, the ones that we think would support us the most, who seem like are the most against us even sometimes. And that's very heartbreaking. That's very hard for us when we face that. It seems like everyone is out to get us. But then he says, we're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're not abandoned because we know that he is with us. And he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And then the last one, he says, we're cast down. That is the idea of a boxing match. You know, when, when someone's boxing, when two people are boxing, a lot of times one of them can, can get a good punch in and it might knock the person down. He said, you know what? We, we've, we've had a lot of, of, of heavy blows you ever just feel like you're so beat up sometimes? <laughs> you don't know what to do. You know, sometimes we can get knocked down in this life. He says, he says, we've been cast down, but we're not destroyed. In other words, we haven't been knocked completely out. And you know, it's very interesting when we think about what he's saying here because we see two different perspectives. And I really think the key to this is, the, the two perspectives is one of them is with God. The other one is without God. Because when we see everything through the perspective of God and what God is doing, we can say just like Paul, you know what, we've been, we've been under a lot of pressure. A lot of times we don't know what's going on. A lot of times we feel persecuted. We, we've ha taken some heavy blows and we've even been knocked down. But you know what, we haven't been completely destroyed. We're not going to throw in the towel. We haven't been abandoned and we haven't been knocked out. And we can continue on faithfully trusting in our Lord. But if we try to face those things without Him we'll end up on the other side, and we won't last long. Because I, I want to tell you, in our, just in our Christian life in general, and when it comes to serving the Lord, when it comes to doing what God wants us to do, you know, if we try to do it in our own strength, we will fail miserably. Yeah. And we'll fail very quickly at that. And, and many times we'll fail over and over and over. And a lot of times, it, the, the interesting or the ironic thing is how we don't understand why we're failing so much. Or, or sometimes we'll even, we'll even kind of blame God for that, won't we? We'll say, God, why are you allowing this? And yet we get up, we try to do it again, and we fail. When God all along is saying, you know what? I'm here to be with you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to strengthen you if you'll just trust in me. And you know, it's our attitude. It's our perspective about how if we see the things that we have to face with God and trusting in Him, or if we try to do those things on our own, in our, in our own strength. We will not last long. We will throw in the towel. We will faint by the wayside. So the second thing, first thing we see is, Humility. The second thing we see is attitude. The third thing we see here is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Verse 10, 11, and 12. Verse 10 and 11, basically, he repeats the same thing. He says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest manifest in our mortal flesh. Now, this is, this is uh, Paul refuting the accusations. Because 2 Corinthians, if you study 2 Corinthians, has a lot to do with Paul refuting the accusations of the false prophets towards him. All the accusations of his motives, who he was, his doctrine. 
And so here, there was a lot of accusations that Paul was suffering because of sin in his life. He, was, he must have secret sin. That's why he's suffering. And Paul is telling us here that, that the reason he suffers is because he's willing to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, bearing about in, in his body the dying of the Lord. Because when we think about the Lord, why did he come here to this earth? He came here with one purpose. He came here to die for our sins. He came here to sacrifice himself for our sins. And so Paul basically is saying, I'm willing to follow the example of my Lord, and I'm willing to sacrifice everything that needs to be sacrificed, my own life if it's necessary, to be able to take the gospel to these people. He was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to give all. And the interesting thing is what the results of that was, because both times, in verse 10 and 11, He says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. That the life of Jesus. So when we think about Jesus' death, when he died, praise the Lord, he didn't just die. Amen? Because if he died and that was the end of the story, we wouldn't even be talking about him today. It would be complete failure. But we know that Jesus, in his power, was raised from the dead. He arose from the dead, and when we think about that, we think about God's power. We think about Jesus' power. We think about victory, because he had victory over death when he raised, it, it, so that we could also have victory in our lives. So what Paul is telling us here is that he was willing to follow Christ's example in his suffering, in his sacrifice, and the result of that was to see God's power and God's victory in his life when he lived that out in his every day, in every day. When he lived that out, he had God's power, God's hand, God's victory, and through willing to sacrifice, willing to pay all, a complete giving in and giving up and giving everything to God, he was willing, he was able to see God's hand and God's power and God's strength in his life. And that's the only way that we can continue faithfully is, is by being willing to let God have his way, being willing to suffer and sacrifice if it's necessary. But to be honest, when we think about that, do we really sacrifice a lot? Do we really sacrifice so much? When, when, it, when we really think about it and come down to it, we really don't sacrifice a lot, do we? Now, in comparison, we don't really sacrifice a lot. In comparison to Jesus, in comparison to Paul, we don't sacrifice a lot because he's blessed us so much in our life. So the results for Paul was that he could see the life, the power, the victory of Jesus. But also in verse 12, we see what the results were for others. And he tells them, he tells the Corinthians, he said, So then, death worketh in us, but what? Life in you. So you see, all Paul's sacrifice had one main purpose, so that he could preach the gospel to them and so that they could pass from death to life, so that they could hear the gospel and be saved, so that God could transform and change their life. In our video, we mentioned uh, a young lady that, uh, a young girl that came to our church that was invited by one of the other ladies and came and came to our youth group first and she got saved. Her name was Jessenia, Jesse. And she got saved uh, in our youth group and began to come faithfully to our church and uh, began to really get involved. My oldest daughter was able to disciple her and to see her grow in the Lord tremendously. And it, when, uh, a few months after she had uh, been coming to the church and she had gotten saved, we had a testimony time. And she got up and she gave her testimony. And it was just amazing as I heard her testimony because until that time, I did not know what she had been facing before she came to church. Where basically her family didn't want to have anything to do with her and her little brother. They basically, her mother had kicked them out, basically said, I can't deal with you anymore. I don't want to see you anymore. You have to find somewhere else to live and kick them out. And she was so hurt and so destroyed by that that she decided she was going to take her own life. She basically said, well, no one loves me, no one wants me, no one cares for me, why would I want to continue living? And it was that very time when this lady heard about that and called her and went and and began to help them and took her to church. And as she told her testimony, she told about how she came to church and for the first time she realized what true love was. She realized that her life could have purpose and when she trusted Christ as her Savior, the Lord changed her completely. That God gave her a new perspective. God gave her a new life. God changed her everything. And and she told how that the week after she came to church, she had already decided she was going to commit suicide. And if she hadn't come to church and she hadn't gotten saved, she would have done that very thing. And I think if you were to ask Jessenia about how important it was that someone invited her to church and that there was even a church there that would preach the gospel to them, I think she would say it's very important and it's worth it 
that there was someone there to preach the gospel. And so when we think about the little bit of sacrifice that we have to make in our lives, when we think about the difference it could make in the lives of many, it's such a small sacrifice that we would make. It's such a small, small sacrifice to know how so, so many people are passed from death unto life. And they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The last thing we see here, the fourth thing, the fourth word is hope. Hope. In verse 13, he first talks about the confidence that we have. He says, we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written. I believed and therefore I have, have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. So basically what Paul is saying there is the confidence that he has in the message that he has received. He had heard it, he had believed it, and therefore he must speak it to other, person, other people. And so therefore he realized it was the truth. He realized that the message that he was preaching was the truth. It was the only truth. It was the only way that they could truly be changed and they can come to know the Lord. And so there was that truth and that confidence in the truth and the message that he was preaching that gave him the hope that he had. And we see that in verse 14. Because he says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord, excuse me, shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. See, Paul could continue faithfully because he realized that that at the end of his journey, he would at that time receive the reward for all that he had done. Because you see, if we look for our reward here on this earth and in our lives, the Bible tells us we have received our reward, which is basically the praise of men, basically what we receive here. But we have to realize that our reward is not here on this earth. Our reward awaits us one day when we get to heaven. And you know, and I really believe that one day when we get to heaven, we'll be able to say that it's all been worth it. I think we'll really be able to say, you know, any little sacrifice, any difficulty, any challenge, any trial that I had to face, it seemed so hard and so difficult that I really wanted to give up. I really wanted to faint. I really wanted to throw in the towel. We will, we'll be able to say with confidence, it's all been worth it. And I'm so thankful that I did not faint. I'm so thankful that I did not give in. And we'll be able to all stand before God, as he says there in verse 14, and, and, and be presented with those, all those that we've been able to take this treasure of the gospel to, and God has been able to transform their lives. And then we get down to verse 15, and he tells us what it's really all about. He says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Of God, Because one day when we stand before Him, that treasure that we have carried and taken and given to so many people will in turn be changed or transferred or, or changed out for, for precious souls that God has been allowed us to lead to Him. And one day we'll be able to stand before Him and with all those, the multitudes that God has, has taken that treasure to and God has saved, maybe, maybe through us or, or, or through others, and for all of eternity we'll be able to glorify, praise His name. Now I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but have you ever had one of those moments when you just feel so close to God? And there's never a greater feeling than to, to feel so close to God. You almost feel like you can feel the presence of God. Well, if that's such a great experience in our lives, what is it going to be like when we're actually standing before Him one day? When we're standing there in His presence, no more pain, no more trials, no more sadness, and for all of eternity, we can praise and glorify His name. I really believe at that moment, we're going to be able to stand there and say, I'm so glad that I continued faithful. <clears throat> My life's verse, the verse that I've <coughs> claimed many years ago, is Romans chapter 8, verse 18. And it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I'll be honest, I, I don't think that I've faced a lot of, of, of difficulties. I don't think that I've, I've uh, suffered a lot in my life. But anything that I do face, and any difficulty or challenge or suffering, anything that I do have to face, I can always remember that verse because it tells us those things are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that He has waiting for us one day. And we put all that into perspective. I want to tell you, it will, should encourage us and energize us and help us to continue faithfully doing what He has called us to do. And you as a church, continuing faithfully, without fainting, 
doing what God has called us to do, to take the gospel to the world, to do more for Him than we've ever done before, trusting in His hand, trusting in His power, trusting in His might, that He's going to do a gr- continue to do a great work here in this place, in, the, in your midst, and through you, and through your lives. Years ago, when we were there in Bolivia, we have a statue you, you saw in the video of, of Jesus. It's a white statue that overlooks the entire city of Cochabamba with his arms outstretched, much like the statue that you've seen, probably the more famous statue of Brazil that overlooks Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And uh, we, were, we take a lot of people when they come to visit, we take them there because you can see the entire city. It's almost 360 degrees around that mountain, around that statue. And they take pictures and we show them the city and show them the different sites. And I was up there with a group early on in our ministry that was visiting with us. And I'd been up there many times, so I was just kind of standing over to the side while they were taking pictures and, you know, all the different things. And I noticed that there was a, an older lady who walked up with a young girl, looked like it must have been her granddaughter, and they walked up to the statue of Jesus. And as they walked up to the statue, they, she crossed herself, as they often do, and she began to pray. And as they were standing there, the little girl was just kind of looking around and just kind of taking it all in. And and she noticed there was a very large cast iron Bible that was open right there at the feet of Jesus. And she looked at it for the first time and, and she was like, wow. And she tugged on her grandmother's arm and she said, grandmother, what does that say? And her grandmother looked down for the first time and she said, Jesús les respondió y les dijo, Yo soy el camino, la verdad y la vida. Nadie viene al Padre sino por mí. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I thought, hmm, interesting. And I kind of got my attention when she did that because I noticed that and that she read that verse. And the little girl was interested in that. And they stood there for a couple of minutes and the little girl tugged on her grandmother's shirt again and she said, but grandmother, what does that mean? I thought, oh, I want to hear the answer to this. I wonder how she explains that, maybe explains it in a different way or, 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 or some way to explain that. And, and I, I kind of took a step closer because I really wanted to hear. And they stood there for several minutes in complete silence. And the grandmother reached out and grabbed her granddaughter's hand and they turned and walked away. And I just stood there with my mouth open. And as they walked off and they walked down the stairs and I looked out across the city of Cochabamba, a million and a half people, The only thing I could think about was how many thousands of young girls in that city are asking the same question. How can I know God? How can I know I'm going to heaven one day? And the answer is always the same. Complete silence. Because they have no idea of how to explain to them a verse that is so so special to you and I and so simple to you and I. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the only way to get to heaven. So many people around the world still have never heard the message. And I want to encourage you, when we hear about that and we think about that, we cannot faint. We cannot stop. We cannot give in. We must continue striving to take the gospel, the treasure of the gospel, to the world.